Hey folks, I am in the midst of a series of episodes looking at different approaches of representing global climate change using temperatures. The data that I'm using I got from NASA's GISS department, uh, where they've been tracking global temperatures since 1890 all the way up to the current date. Uh, in the previous episodes, we've looked at a line plot, we've looked at uh, colored on a gradient uh, bar plots. In today's episode, I want to look at a kind of iconic representation called a warming stripe. Uh, these warming stripes you can find at showyourstripes.info, um, and they're originally created by Ed Hawkins at uh, the University of Reading. Um, I've heard of people taking these weather stripes and knitting Afghans out of them, uh, where you basically make a different stripe or different row, um, a different color, a different shade of blue or red, depending on the annual uh, global temperature. So what I want to do is I want to recreate this visual in R. So there's this labeled version, and there's also the unlabeled version, which again, you could imagine this being an Afghan or perhaps a necktie, who knows? I will make the labeled version in R. Along the way, we'll also see how we can make uh, the unlabeled version. Uh, perhaps you want to take that and you could, you know, use that as a plan to make your own Afghan or necktie or who knows what. Um, but this is a bit of an iconic visualization of global climate change. And I think certainly tells the story that as time goes along, again, each column here represents a different year. And as time marches forward, things are getting warmer. Um, their data was normalized, I think between like 1870 or 1971 and 1990, um, or maybe 2000. Our data from NASA is normalized between 1951 and 1980. So it'll look a little bit different, but it'll be the same idea. So I have a fresh R script with library tidyverse already there so that I don't forget to run it. I'll go ahead and load that. Um, if you wanna get the code and the data that I'm working with down below in the description, there's a link to a blog post that'll get you everything you needed. Um, so I have my project organized so that I have a directory for my code for my data and for my figures. And so I have the CSV that we need that I got from NASA in my data directory. So I'll start with read CSV. And then in quotes, I'll put data forward slash. And one of the nice things about our studio is I can hit tab and it'll tell me the different files that are in my data directory. So I don't have to remember this horrible file name. Who does this? Ah, NASA, come on. Anyway, so we'll do that. I also know from previous episodes that the first line of this file is a header row that's not important. It's not column names, it's descriptive. So I can do skip equals one to skip that first line of the file. Also, I know that it represents NA values with three stars. So I'll do NA equals star, star, star. This loads our data frame and we can now see we have a year column and then columns for each of the months. Uh, I've got this kind of blown it up a little bit, kind of zoomed in. And so there's extra columns that don't fit on the screen. And you'll see there's also December and then there's a J through D for January through December, the calendar year, as well as D through N, December through November, um, and then each quarter of the year. I'm interested in the J through D. So I will go ahead and pipe this into a select where we'll get the year and the J through D. I'll rename this to be lowercase year, and then I will call this T underscore diff. Uh, people on previous episodes have commented that I should learn the janitor package because it'll do this for me easily. And you're right, I should learn it, but you know, this isn't so bad for the minimal amount of cleanup I have to do on this data frame. So maybe if you'd like to learn more about the janitor package, let me know down below in the comments and I'll see if I can't cook up a little um, episode to teach me and you <laughs> how to use that package because I've seen it in a number of places now. All right, so we have this data frame, 143 rows for each year, and we also then have a column for the temperature difference. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and call this T underscore data. All right, and then I can take T underscore data and I can pipe that to ggplot AES. And when I think about those warming stripes, I see a heat map, right? And I see on the x-axis, the year, the y-axis is like one value. Um, so maybe y would be pinned at one or some constant. And then the color, the fill of the tiles of a heat map is indicated by what I'm calling T underscore diff. Suppose you could probably make this as a bar chart, but I think that would just get kind of messy because I think by default, it's gonna put spaces in between those bars. So I'm gonna use a heat map using geom tile to do this here. So again, on the x, we'll do year. On Y, like I said, I'm gonna set it equal to one as a constant, so it'll have the same Y value for all years. 
for fill, I'll do T underscore diff, and then I'll do geom tile. And there we go, we have our warming strips. <laughs> it's got a ways to go, but don't worry, we'll get there soon enough. What I notice uh, about the default temperature gradient or fill gradient um, that it gives us is that it's a monotonic color change, right? From like dark blue to light blue, but we have negative values. And so that monotonic color change works well when you're going from like zero up to another number, but we're going from like negative number to a positive number. I like to set white to be my color at zero, right? So in the last episode, I talked about various scale fill gradient and scale fill steps functions. If I look back at the original version of the warming stripes, these are discrete colors mapped to temperature changes, right? This is not a continuous change, right? There's like a five or six year window in here where everything's the same color blue. So they're binning the temperature differences into discrete temperatures, uh, discrete colors, right? And so instead of scale fill gradient, which gives you the continuous change, I'm gonna use scale fill steps to get a stepwise discrete change, right? Because my values go through zero, I'll start with scale fill steps two. So we'll do scale fill steps two, and then I can do low equals blue, uh, mid equals white, and then high equals red. Those aren't the actual colors, but we'll come back and change that in a moment. And so what I get are four different breaks, or four different colors in here. So it's picking breaks for me, going from blue up to red. Let's go ahead and add more breaks. And so I'll go ahead and do break, end breaks equals, let's say 12. And so now I get 12 breaks from like minus 0.5 up to say like 1.1 or so, whatever the top level there is. What I'm noticing is that the lower level isn't the same uh, intensity, uh, the th same saturation as the upper level, right? And so this level of blueness doesn't match this level of redness. Again, when I look at the warming stripes, that is um, matched, right? So like this is the lowest temperature and that's got the same saturation, I think that's the right term, um, as the maximum red color. So I'd like to match that, right? So the trick that we saw in the last episode was to instead use scale fill steps n, and then we'll have color, and I will give that a vector of color. So I'll do blue, uh, white, uh, red, and I don't need those um, low, mid, high. And we can go ahead and do that, and oh, that needs to be colors, not color. So now I see that the minimum level has the same saturation as the maximum value, right? But, <laughs> we're gaining on it, honest, but what we see in the middle here, that white is occurring between like 0.2 and 0.3. So what I need to do is rescale my colors to match the scale of my temperature differences. And to do that, we're going to go ahead and load a library that um, comes installed with the tidyverse called scales. And what we can then add in here would be values equals rescale. And so we're gonna rescale the tdiff values. And so we're gonna give it a vector of values that we want to rescale. And so I'll do the min of t data dollar sign t diff. Uh, so that's the lower end, zero. So the lower end goes with the blue, zero will go with white. And then we need the upper end, which will be the same thing as this, but instead of min, we'll put in max. And again, if we take this uh, function call, uh, I missed the parentheses there, but you get the idea, um, that we see now, though, that we've got NA.5 NA. I think what's happening, obviously, is that with uh, this min, um, that there's an NA value. And I think that's because the year 2022, this year, um, has an NA value. So if I do uh, T data uh, tail, yeah. 2022 has an NA. So I need to come back up here and use a pipe. And I'll do drop NA. And now that should get rid of that. So if I rerun this rescale, yeah, now it goes 0 0.321 um, and that it's rescaling my T diff column between 0 and 1 with 0 0.32 getting assigned to the white, the 0, the blue, 1, the red. Missing a comma here. And so now we see that our lower end is that bright blue, the upper end is that bright red, and right at the white around zero is the white, right? Good, so let's see if we can't do a better job of matching the colors in the original heat map. If we come back to this heat map, 
um, I can leverage a great tool that comes installed with um, the Mac operating system. I know Windows also has this tool, um, but it's basically a color picker um, in Mac land. It's called a digital color meter. Um, and there are similar types of apps that you can get as plugins for Chrome and other browsers. But basically the idea is that I can put my cursor over a color and then it shows me the RGB um, hexadecimal that I can then plug in as a replacement for blue or red, right? So this is 0836B. So I'll do 0836B. And then for the dark red, that's gonna be 67000D, 67000D. And now I see I've got uh, the dark blue and the dark red uh, matching more or less what we saw on the website. Excellent. Uh, we are gaining on it slowly but surely. So now what I wanna do is take the warming stripes that we have here and start to reformat it to look like what we had over on the web page. One of the things to notice about both the labeled version as well as the raw version is that the warming stripes go all the way to the edge of the plotting window. Looking at our version of the figure, we see that there is a bit of a margin around the warming stripes, but within uh, the panel. And so we can get rid of that border by going into chord Cartesian uh, and then doing expand equals false. You can also set the expand to be zero for scale X continuous and scale Y continuous, but I figured let's do it in one step. And now we see that the warming stripes go to those edges, which is great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the legend for the heat map and up here in geom tile, I can do show.legend uh, equals false. Um, now we can go ahead and get rid of the text and those tick marks. And I'm gonna do that in one step with theme void. And so now we see our warming stripes go to the boundaries of the window, right? There's no margin, um, everything looks pretty good. Um, and I'm pretty happy with the way that appears. What I'm gonna do at this point is go ahead and output the figure to a PNG so that it's in the format, the size that I want it to be. Because when I start moving things around to kind of add those black margins and titles and stuff, I want it to look more or less the way you know, I want it. This is also the raw version of the warming stripes image. So I can do gg save. I can put this into my figures directory and I'll call it warming stripes uh, .png. And then my width, I'm gonna make um, eight. And my height, I'll make 4.5. So there's our version of the warming stripes without any annotation. Um, it's the same idea as we saw from the University of Reading. Um, Again, things are scaled slightly differently. Ours are scaled from 1951 to 1980. Theirs was scaled more recently, right? So that gives a bit of a different appearance um, to the overall plot. Now what I wanna do is go ahead and add um, those dates across the x-axis and we'll also add the title. So I'm gonna go in here and do theme um, and we'll do um, axis.text.x and I'll do element text. And I now see that I've got those dates across the X axis. It starts at 1880 um, and that 18 gets lopped off again because we did that expand equals zero. What I'd rather do is perhaps have it start at like 1890 and go every 30 years. Um, I think it will go to 2010. Again, to achieve that, we can come back up here and do scale X continuous and I'll do breaks equals seek from 1890 to 2000, I'm gonna go ahead and do 2020. If it doesn't get to 2020, it's not gonna complain. Um, and again, what that seek function does is build a vector from 1890 and 30 year increments stopping at 2020, right? And so now we see these are gonna be the years that will be on our X axis. And yeah, sure enough, it ends at 2010. Go ahead and add a plus here. So that puts our dates in a better place. What I'd like to do is turn the background to be black and then set the font of my dates, my years to be white. And I can achieve that again here in element text. I can do color equals white. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and add a margin. So I'll do margin equals margin. And then my top, um, let's go ahead and add like five points. And the bottom, maybe let's do 10. And we'll do unit equals uh, PT. I'll go ahead and put this on a separate line so it doesn't wrap around. And then we'll do um, plot.background and we'll do element rect fill equals black. Very good. We now have that black bottom border 
with those dates nicely placed. Let's go ahead and do the title now. And so the title was global temperature change and then the range of years. So up here, I will do labs and I'll say title equals global temperature change. And I'll do uh, 18XX to 2002X. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in the actual numbers here in a moment. Let's do that. Um, also, this is gonna plot as black text rather than white text. Um, and so if it's black, then we won't see it. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna copy this down and we'll then do plot.title and we'll do white and then, um, yeah, let's, tr let's try that for a margin. So I think I'd rather flip the bottom and top margin to have a little bit extra space at the top and less space on the bottom. I'd also like some space on the left there. So I can again switch uh, on plot title, the T and the B, and I'll go ahead and do L, uh, and let's say uh, 20. I like the flipped top and bottom margin for the title. It didn't respect what I put in for the left margin. I think the for the title, it really wants me to use the horizontal justification to place things um, along the X axis. So let's go back into our code and instead of L equals 20, what I'll do is I will give it H just, um, and let's do say 0 0.1. Uh, so H just of zero will be left justified, one will be right justified, 0.5 will be centered. And then if we give it kind of increments in between, it'll space it accordingly. Obviously that did bump it over. I think I wanna move it back half ways. So I'll come back in here instead of 0.1, I'll do 0.05. I like that placement a lot better. The last thing that I wanna do is take on these dates. So I could hard code it to be 1890 to 2021 or whatever it is, but if you came along next year and did this, then you know, you'd know you have fresher data, but the, the title wouldn't have been updated. So let's go ahead and programmatically insert the date into the title. To do that, we're gonna use the glue package. So I'll do library glue. Uh, glue comes installed with the tidyverse, so all you need to do is library glue. And down here in the title, I'm gonna wrap the title in glue. And in here in the parentheses then, I'm gonna put a set of uh, curly braces like so. Um, I guess maybe not quite like so, <laughs> uh, remove all that stuff. And then in here, I'm gonna put a min and max function. So I'll do min on t data dollar sign year. And then for my upper bound, I'm gonna put in max, right? So instead of min, max, there you go. We now have that updated year range. Again, you could come along five years from now, um, rerun this without having to insert the actual dates, and that would go up to 2021, to, uh, to 2025 or 26 or whatever uh, the year was that you would have data for when you ran this code. Um, and so that's pretty cool, right? So I think we've done a very good job of reproducing the original version of the figure. Um, what do I think of this? Well, again, I think this is good for telling a story, maybe for some shock value. Um, the, the temperature, um, you know, losing a legend, I guess the scientist in me wants that legend. Um, I think a line plot does a better job of showing uh, the change. This is a lot more artistic and I think uh, tells a story in a different way, right? You know, would I put this into a paper, a scientific paper? Probably not, but would I put this up on a billboard? Yeah, that would be really compelling, right? So um, I think that looks really good. The main difference at this point is the source of data and what the data were normalized to. Again, my data was normalized between 1951 and 1980. The Ed Hawkins data from the University of Reading was, was more recent. And so that's gonna give a, a different color profile, right? Anyway, I think they tell the same story that things are getting warmer. That is not good, right? Anyway, encourage you as always to run through this code on your own. See if you can't, you know, take this further and try to, you know, improve it and put your own spin on these warming stripes. Keep practicing with this. Tell your friends what we're doing here so we can get more people to watch. I've been really just, um, you know, really pleased to see the positive feedback that people are giving me for this series of episodes. I can tell people are really excited about it. If you've got ideas for other things or other ways to represent climate change data, by all means, let me know and I'll try to work it into this series. We'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.